Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What's your story? More specifically, what do you know about your family's story? Do you know where your grandparents grew up and how they made a living? Do you know how your parents met? Do you know of a tragedy that struck your family? Do you know the story of your birth? If you know the answers to some or maybe all of these questions, then you would score well on the aptly named Do You Know scale. This scale was developed by two psychologists who used it to assess the emotional health of young children. The psychologists discovered that the more children know about their family's history, the more they feel in control of their lives, the higher their self-esteem, and the more they feel like their families function well. It turns out that the Do You Know scale is a great predictor, not just of happiness and well-being, but also of resilience, how easily children recover from setbacks big and small. Psychologists also found that when parents teach children their family stories, they usually choose either an ascending narrative or a descending narrative. An ascending narrative is a story like this. We used to have nothing, but because of your grandparents' hard work building the family business, we became successful. A descending narrative is of a family who used to have it all, but then something, maybe an illness or a stock market crash or a natural disaster, caused them to lose everything. Well, the two stories we've heard today place us smack in the middle of what appear to be steeply descending narratives. A widow struggling to survive a famine, and the disciples caught in a storm. In 1 Kings, just before today's passage, we meet uh, Elijah. He has been called to be the prophet of Israel during the reign of King Ahab, one of the Israelites' worst ever kings. Ahab marries the evil Jezebel, who encourages him to worship the Canaanite storm god Baal. The Bible tells us that Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord than all the kings of Israel before him. Things were definitely on the decline for God's people. So the Lord has appointed a, the, the prophet Elijah to announce God's punishment against Ahab, an extended drought, a death sentence for a people who are dependent on agriculture. God sends Elijah to Zarephath, the very heartland of the cult of Baal and the home country of Jezebel. 
There, God says, Elijah will be fed throughout the drought by a local widow. But like the Israelites, the widow is in the midst of her own descending narrative. Her husband is dead. She has a small child to support, and now there is a terrible drought. It is never a good time to be a widow in the ancient world, but during a drought, already scarce resources become practically non-existent. This widow has already figured out how her story is going to end. She and her son are going to die. The disciples are also convinced that they are going to die. After witnessing the miracle of Jesus feeding thousands of people with just a couple of loaves and fishes, Jesus sends them off in a boat out on a lake. The boat ends up way farther from shore than the disciples want to be, and there's a strong wind working against every effort they are making to get back to land. Death is staring them in the face, and they are afraid. Writing about the death of his mother after a long illness, Tom Long recalls how every day when she was in hospice care, she would beckon one of the loved ones keeping vigil at her side and whisper the words, I'm hungry. She had a feeding tube, and she was getting as much broth and pureed foods as her dying body could handle, but every day she kept saying to them, I'm hungry. The hospice staff assured the family that her body could not feel hunger pains, but nevertheless, this was upsetting to them. One day, Tom entered the room and found her restless in her bed. What's wrong? He asked her. Are you hungry? Very, she whispered. Tom felt helpless. He didn't know what to do. He tried to give her some soft food, but after a couple of bites, she shook her head. No more. Slowly, it dawned on me, he writes, I'm hungry was her way of describing the totality of her circumstance. She was not asking for food. She was saying that everything was slipping away. Her personal history was closing down, coming to an end. Her days of breath and food and light and family and the touch of love were ebbing, And she was hungry, hungry for more, hungry for the life being taken away from her, very hungry. The widow of Zarephath was hungry, so hungry that she's accepted imminent death by starvation. But she is also hungry the same way Tom Long's mother was hungry at the end of her life, hungry for a better life for herself and her son, hungry for community and support, hungry for respect and dignity. All alone on that boat, battered by the wind and the waves, the disciples are hungry too. Maybe literally they've been out on that water for a long time, but certainly spiritually, which is why they're hanging out with Jesus in the first place. They are hungry for a better life for themselves and their families, hungry for community and support, hungry for respect and dignity. Of all the disciples, Peter is always the hungriest. He always wants to know the answer. He's always hungry for Jesus' attention. If Jesus is walking on water, then Peter wants to do the same thing. Peter is hungry to get out of the boat and in on this latest miracle, and he does until a strong wind blows, and he realizes what he's doing, and his fear gets the better of him. After the widow tells Elijah her sad story of how she's going to make a final meager meal for herself and her son and then die, this strange prophet from another land says to her, "'Do not be afraid.'" Jesus says the same thing to those panicked disciples who think he is a ghost walking toward them on the churning waters of the sea. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I don't know about you, 
but those are words I am hungry for right now. Be not afraid. Storms and droughts, both literal and metaphorical, are raging all around us. We are battered by winds that keep us from getting where we want to go. We are starved by a lack of civility and stability and predictability. The ground feels like it is shifting beneath our feet. But in these two biblical stories, in which very different people face very different circumstances, God's message is the same. Be not afraid. The writer Anne Lamott once took a vacation to Lake Tahoe with her two-year-old son, Sam. This area near Reno is a hotbed of gambling, which means all the rooms in the hotels or condos have curtains so heavy and thick that the rooms can be as dark as night, even in the middle of the day. One afternoon, Anne put Sam down for a nap in his crib, closed the curtains, and then went into the other room to work, pulling the door shut behind her. A few minutes later, she heard Sam calling to her. He'd climbed out of his crib, gotten to the door, grasped the doorknob, and depressed the button lock. Try as she might, Anne could not get him to understand that all he needed to do was twist the doorknob to unlock the door. When it became clear that his mother couldn't open the door, Sam cried and screamed while Anne, in a panic, called the rental agency for the condo and left message after message. Finally, not knowing what else to do, she lay down next to the door, reached her fingers in the small space underneath it, and told Sam to do the same and find her fingers in the dark. He did. And as the reality of his mother's love and presence sunk in, Sam gradually calmed down. Mother and son stayed like that for a long time, lying on the floor, side by side, a locked door between them, taking comfort in the touch of their fingers. In addition to ascending and descending narratives, there is a third kind of narrative that some families tell. It is called an oscillating narrative, and it's a story that involves ups and downs, good times and bad. There was the successful family business, but then grandpa was injured in the war and could no longer work, and the business failed. Your mother put herself through college and got a good job, but then she got laid off. But no matter what, we stuck together as a family. Psychologists have, have discovered that it is this oscillating narrative that gives children the most self-confidence because they learn that they can expect both good times and bad times and that they can weather even the most difficult circumstances. It turns out that telling all of our stories not just the ones that make us look good or make us feel good, but also the ones that show how we cope with the bad. That is what builds our capacity for resilience. Those kids who scored well on the do you know scale, they only did so because someone in their families took the time to share with them the family stories, not just the successful stories, but the failures as well. Which means that if we don't take the time and muster the courage to have difficult conversations about our stories, the stories of our families, our church, our country, then we won't reap the benefits that come from a deeply rooted and clear-eyed awareness of our successes and our failures. One of the greatest things about being a part of something that's bigger than ourselves, a family, a school, a church, a country, is that we can have the opportunity to learn the oscillating narrative of that community. Because if we're honest, every community's narrative is an oscillating one. And when we join together with people in that community, 
It is by telling our stories, teaching them to the children, talking amongst ourselves about what they mean and what we can learn from them, that we build our capacity for both resilience and trust. Telling our stories helps us to be honest about our past. Yes, there have been bad times when things looked really dark and we were hungry in all kinds of ways and battered by all kinds of storms. But telling our stories also teaches us the ways God shows up in the midst of them. In the Bible stories that we've heard, in church history, in the histories of our families, we often experience God with us, providing for us just when we think our story is coming to an end. According to the oscillating narrative of our Christian faith, this is what God does. God shows up. God provides. God finds the crack beneath the door and does whatever it takes to be with us. God loves. Now, what God provides may not be much more than a scant handful of meal and a few drops of oil, or the reach of a steady hand to help us when we start sinking, or the barest touch of fingers underneath a locked door. But by God's grace, it is enough. Today, we gather around this table, and this is the table where we tell our most sacred stories. It is a table where we practice welcoming everyone. It is not a table where we are supposed to come only if we're perfect, but a table where we are called to acknowledge our mistakes. This table is where we receive God's gift of endless second chances. And the only requirement for receiving this meal is that we come hungry, hungry for love, hungry for justice, for peace, for forgiveness, hungry for God. It took great courage for that widow to share her meager provisions with a stranger. It took great courage for Peter to step out of the boat and walk toward Jesus on the water. In both cases, that courage was ignited by hunger hunger both physical and spiritual. Are you hungry? Hungry for a better life? Hungry for community and support? Hungry for dignity and respect? Hungry for love and mercy? Then come to this table, and may this meager meal and the God who provides it give you courage beyond your imagination so that wherever your story has brought you today, you would know God's presence and God's provision and with confidence and faith claim your part in God's story. Amen.